In America, there's a burglary every 11 seconds, an armed robbery every 65 seconds, a violent crime every 25 seconds, a murder every 24 minutes. Tonight, the man known as the Night Slasher has apparently struck for the 16th time in just over a month's time. The 22-year-old victim was mutilated with a sharp instrument and seemed to be just as unlikely a victim as the other 15. The Night Slasher preys upon anyone. His victims have included businessmen, Asian immigrants, the elderly, and in one case, a sexually assaulted child. The serial killer has thrown the city into a growing panic, and up until now, no one has had a clue to his identity. Kill her. You know almost every sicko in this city. Shake him down. Do what you have to do to get a lead on this maniac. If I find him, do what you do best. What do you think? It looks a little like him. So tonight you'll stay here and tomorrow we'll move you to a place called Safe House, okay? Why do I have to stay around this? I want to go. Well, because you're the only one that can place him at the scene of the crime. Until we get him, that's the way it's got to be. We are the hunters. We kill the weak so the strong survive. You can't stop the new world. Your filthy society will never get rid of people like us. It's breathing them! This is where the law stops. And I start. I'm a hero of the new world! We are the future! In late May of 1986, Cobra hit the big screen in the USA and made its way to the UK in early August, starring action star Sylvester Stallone in the lead role and directed by the late George Cosmatos, who had directed Rambo First Blood Part 2 and later Leviathan and Tombstone. Produced on a fairly large budget for the time at $25 million, it went on to earn $49 million in the USA and made most of its money worldwide, earning $160 million. Despite its success, it didn't go down well, with the critics getting mostly negative reviews. Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune compared Cobra to Dirty Harry, giving the film two and a half stars out of four, summarising it as Filthy Harry. Siskel noted that the film had a great opening sequence and couldn't maintain the momentum. Roger Ebert lamented that Stallone was squandering his talent and vast potential. The LA Times said since the first Rocky, Stallone has been paring down each of his scripts whittling at them like soap bars. He's already done away with characterization, logic, coherent story, motivation and background. Now he's zeroing in on dialogue. Cobra's pretentious emptiness, its dumbness, its two-faced morality make it a movie that begs to be laughed off. The New York Times said the film pretends to be against a wanton violence of a disintegrating society, but it's really the apotheosis of that violence it shows such content for the most basic American values though Variety called it a sleek, extremely violent and exciting police thriller, and compared Cobra favourably to Rocky and Rambo. In response to the critical backlash the film got, Stallone admitted in September of 1986 to the LA Times, I was trying to infuse horror and slasher genre techniques into a police thriller. It was a risky formula, especially in the summertime, which tends to be a lighter time. I was trying to attack the judicial system, but I was trying to do it in a certain way, with a cop who was like an android. I said let's get right down to it, to me against them. But it was a dark subject matter, and I know I made certain mistakes with it. Next time I'll take Cobra into a different area entirely. Despite those mixed reviews, it made a healthy profit and found a bigger audience on home video, arriving during the height of the VHS rental boom, and talks of a sequel were discussed over the years and even a TV series that never moved past the idea's phase. Stallone admitted that Cobra was such a cool character, but he blew it as his personal life got in the way. Stallone recently got involved with a new collectible action figure of Cobra, stating that it was his third favourite character he has played. 
The genesis of Cobra began when Stallone was originally cast to play the lead in Beverly Hills Cop. Back in 1983, when the film was going through its various script changes, Stallone was cast and he had his own ideas and wanted to change some of the script to make the dialogue fit how he talked. His character becomes Axel Cobretti, so he could be called the Motor City Cobra, and the script evolved from a comedy into an action movie. The film was originally budgeted at $14 million, and the studio balked at the idea of including loads of action, as it raised the cost to $20 million. Producer Jerry Brockheimer had always wanted Eddie Murphy in the lead, keeping the comedy direction he initially wanted, so a decision was made to let Stallone go, and for them to pursue Eddie in the lead, and the film became a massive success, spawning two sequels. After Rocky IV, Stallone had the opportunity to reuse his ideas for Beverly Hills Cop for his next project, Cobra. The novel Fair Game by Paula Gosling was cited as a source material for Stallone, who would write the screenplay. George Cosmatos, who had directed Rambo 2 for Sly, was brought on as the director, and he admitted that the book Fair Game was well written but very boring. Stallone changed most of what the book was about and morphed into a Dirty Harry inspired action movie. Fair Game will later be turned into a film in 1995, starring William Baldwin and Cindy Crawford, which was a box office bomb. For years, many fans and critics have said Cobra was a canon film's production. I've seen reviews saying Cobra is an underrated canon movie, it's one of their best features, etc. But it seems canon had little to no involvement in the film. The credits of the movie list Monarchum Golan and Neurum Globus as the producers, but the film does not have the canon logo at the start or at the end. They are never mentioned in any interviews associated with the film. The company's name is not on the posters, video releases. Cobra is never explored in the Electric Boogaloo documentary on canon's history, and it's not discussed in the 1986 documentary The Last Moguls. So why have Golan and Globus got a producer's credit? Well, it's a little confusing. From the Canon Film Guide Volume 2 book, it states that Stallone had a deal with Canon to make Over the Top, but because that was shooting at a later date, it gave Stallone the chance to make Cobra with Warner Brothers. So in order to bypass this exclusive deal Stallone had with Canon, Menachem and Urim were given a producer's credit on Cobra. But if you look at the press kits, it had Canon's name attached, and there is a letter online from the executive producer of Cobra with a Canon letterhead at the bottom, dated from October of 1985, to show there was a connection, but I think overall, it's a Warner Brothers production that has been run through Canon Films in order to bypass Stallone's deal. For the cast, we have Sylvester Stallone as Lieutenant Marion Cobretti, who often goes above the law to get the job done, getting in trouble with his superiors. Stallone was at the height of his success come the mid-80s, and his ego was very much in charge. And during the film's production, he got engaged to Bridget Nielsen, who was 22 at the time and Sly was 39. They were both already married, causing lots of tabloid gossip. They would separate from their partners and would get married a month before the production wrapped on Cobra. Bridget Nielsen plays Ingrid, a model who becomes the next victim of the Night Slasher. Bridget had two films under her belt before filming Cobra. Red Sonja, the fantasy adventure that despite performing and reviewing badly gave her the opportunity to get more work in the USA. She got cast in Rocky IV to play Drago's wife and soon started a relationship with Stallone. Their marriage didn't last long as they divorced in 1987, only lasting two years. She said they rushed into the marriage down to Stallone's persistence and admitted it was not a happy marriage. Brian Thompson plays Night Slasher. Brian was a big fan of Stallone and the Rocky films, and was excited to have his first big role in a feature film, having only had a small role in The Terminator to kickstart his career. Brian did a number of screen tests and eventually found out he got the role while performing as Tyrus Mordor in The Adventures of Conan at Universal Studios. Brian didn't think much of the script and was confused by his character and his existence. He felt this new world order had no connection to the real world. It felt like a comic book movie. Strangely, Brian was not invited to the premiere and had to buy his own ticket to see the movie. Renny Santoni plays Sergeant Tony Gonzalez, Cobra's right-hand man who spends his free time eating chocolate and sweets. Both he and Andrew Robinson starred in Dirty Harry, which Andrew called stunt casting, with Cobra clearly being influenced by Clint Eastwood's famous character, having Rennie and Andrew appear to play out as a nod to Dirty Harry. Rennie, for me, is best known as Poppy from Seinfeld in the great episode where he pees on Jerry's new couch. Could, could he have? <laughs> it is! 
Andrew Robinson plays Detective Monty, who doesn't like Cobra's methods. Andrew didn't like the script, but he felt it had a weirdness to it, and he felt his character had some subtext, with plotting Cobretti's downfall. He found Stallone very accessible and friendly. He felt very sorry for the director George, as he never got his way. With the cuts made to the final film, Andrew felt they had turned it into a music video, essentially. The film had no room to breathe. Going for the MTV audience, they sacrificed character development and relationships. Lee Garlington plays Nancy, who works for the LAPD, and is secretly part of the Night Slashers gang. Lee had appeared in Psycho 2, its sequel, and Field of Dreams. She only did the role because it was a big part in a Stallone movie, and the job paid well. She jokingly said in a recent interview that the shooting schedule was a mess, so she spent a lot of her time playing Scrabble, which didn't bother her as she got paid for the overtime. And last but not least, we have Art Lefleur as Captain Sears. Art didn't have to audition for the part and was asked personally by George if he could play the role of Sears and he accepted. He didn't really see much of the drama the other actors observed and enjoyed the experience of making the film and the finished product. Filming commenced in October of 1985 and they wrapped in January the following year. Originally, Cobra was supposed to be filmed in Seattle, which Brian Thompson discussed in an interview for the Shout Factory Blu-ray. Stallone's earliest draft of the script contained many differences from later drafts and the final film. Locations were changed, and he had a backstory how he had a girlfriend who was killed by a psychopath he was trying to catch. There was an additional big nighttime action sequence on a boat, and there was also a different ending in which it's revealed that Monty was the actual leader of the New World Gang. What became very clear to the cast and crew was that Stallone was in charge of the shoot and would be directing the actors and lining up the shots and requesting the lights be moved to fit his vision for the film. Director George Cosmatos seemed to do what he was told by Stallone, but once Sly was off the set and George was in charge, he became tyrannical shouting and screaming to get his way. Cinematographer Rick Waite, in an interview for Movie Geeks United back in 2012, revealed that George was a great producer but a terrible director who had no technical knowledge and he gained the nickname Comatose. At one point during filming, Stallone complained to Rick Waite that they were falling behind and that he needed to push his crew to work harder. Waite responded by telling Stallone that the delays were due to his fooling around with Bridget Nielsen and showing off his bodyguards. Although Stallone was shocked that somebody would talk to him that way, he cleaned up his act and behaved more professionally, although he returned to his old egocentric behaviour a few weeks later. The big motorcycle sequence was supposed to be shot at night, but Sly changed it to be shot during the day. Rick Waite felt it would reduce the threat, as you could see the bikes coming from a mile off. But it was Stallone's film, so it was switched. The custom 1950 Mercury driven by Cobretti was apparently owned by Sylvester Stallone, but George Cosmatos said in the audio commentary for the DVD and Blu-ray that they had to purchase the car and modify it and they painted it a battleship grey. The production built three Cobra cars for the stunt work. The knife used by the Night Slasher was made for the film by knife designer Herman Schneider. Stallone asked Schneider to create a knife that audiences would never forget. Brian found the knife to be really deadly. The hero knife was so sharp and he would often cut himself by accident. For Cobretti's arsenal, he uses a custom Colt 9mm that features the Cobra on the handle and later in the film he uses a Jetty-Matic submachine gun with a laser target attachment. Though some trivia online suggests that the cast and extras were forbidden from talking to Stallone on set, this isn't entirely true. He was surrounded by bodyguards which made it difficult to approach him at times, but Stallone would make the effort to chat with the people and offer advice if needed, and had a great sense of humour and was accessible to many of the cast. Brian Thompson was struggling with his character's motivation and backstory, as there was nothing on the page to help him with his performance, so Brian had approached Sly and George for advice. Sly said they were like Nazis, but Brian didn't feel there was a connection, so he created his own backstory to help him with his performance. In an unfortunate surprise for Thompson, after filming was completed, the director George Cosmatos unexpectedly told him, you could have been good if you had listened to me. When it came to editing the feature, the first rough cut was around 130 minutes long. They had intended to release it theatrically with a two hour runtime. When the film was submitted to the MPAA, it was rated an X. So Warner Brothers demanded that the more graphic scenes be cut down or removed entirely because they were too intense. Cosmatos said a lot of the scenes at the morgue were cut out as it was too graphic. However, after Top Gun became a smash hit, Stallone and Warner Brothers were worried that Cobra, which would premiere the following week, would be overshadowed. So in order to ensure at least one extra screening each day, the movie was heavily re-edited at the last minute. Stallone removed much of the plot and scenes involving characters other than his own. With the film's story, it opens in LA around Christmas time. 
A lone armed gunman has taken hostages at a supermarket and is refusing to cooperate, so the LAPD summon Cobra, a member of its elite division known as the Zombie Squad. Cobra infiltrates the store, locates and negotiates with the gunman, who threatens him by speaking of a vague and unknown organisation as the New World. Cobra has had enough of him and kills the gunman by throwing a knife and then shooting him dead. Throughout the city there has been a string of attacks and murders, perpetuated by this new gang mentioned by the gunmen which believe in killing the weak, leaving only the strongest and smartest to rule the world. Ingrid who works as a model becomes the gang's next target, after she witnesses their members and their leader, only identified as the Night Slasher, attempting to kill their next victim. After they fail to kill Ingrid in a car park, she is placed under the protective custody of Cobretti and his partner, Tony Gonzalez. When another attempt is made on their lives by the gang, Cobretti theorises that there's an entire army of killers operating rather than a lone serial killer, but his suggestion is rebuffed by his superiors. However, the LEPD agrees with Cobra that it will be safest if he and Ingrid relocate from the city, but they don't realise the LEPD have a mole, and Night Sasha knows of their location and is coming for them. During the 80s, many movies were extended for their TV broadcasts that take advantage of the advertising revenue. Cobra would be extended by roughly six minutes, containing mostly extended bits of dialogue, and after reviewing the TV cut, there isn't anything of major interest aside from the odd scene, where a kid drops off a Christmas present to the desk at the police station, which contains the hands of the latest victim. And the attack on Cobra, we see Night Slash's gang work their way up to his apartment, so they're not just randomly there when he opens the door. At the end, Cobra gets approached by the local police, who don't know who he is. All the scenes that are featured in this cut, you can tell why the majority were trimmed for pacing issues, but like many fans, it would be nice to see the original cut before it was trimmed to meet the demands of the MPAA. Sylvester LeVay would compose the score to Cobra. Sylvester had worked on the TV show Airwolf and many feature films such as Mannequin, Navy Seals, Stone Cold and Hot Shots. From an interview back in 2015, LeVay was asked about his experience working on Cobra and he said, The work on the score was very demanding but also very exciting. For example, I wrote the love theme 2 into 1 that I recorded with Gladys Knight and Bill Medley. Unfortunately, through some arguments between the studio and the artist's lawyers, this recording did not make it into the movie. I performed it instrumentally. The story of Skyline was very simple, it was a substitute for two into one, otherwise the soundtrack would have gotten too short on music. Levy's work often never gets a full release, or a couple of samples of his music find themselves on an album, leaving a vast majority of his work unreleased. Levey further said, It is very sad that the record industry doesn't really care about soundtracks, unless there was a major star from the pop music field involved in the main title song. It is simply an economic factor for them, regardless of the millions of movie fans who would really enjoy having the opportunity to buy a soundtrack from many of their favourite films. The soundtrack arrived in September of 1986 on audio cassette and vinyl, and later appeared on CD in 1992. The album only contains three tracks of his original score, and the rest is pop and rock songs featured in the film. Stan Bush's The Touch, heard in Transformers the movie, was originally written for Cobra, but was later replaced by Feel the Heat, which was overheard during the filming of its music video by Jean Beauvoir, when they were editing in the same building complex, and was added because Stallone loved the song. The music video to Feel the Heat was re-edited to include clips from Cobra. During the end credits, it says the movie is in Eagle Stereo. I thought, that's bizarre, I've never heard of that before, but I quickly discovered it was an early name for Ultra Stereo, which was the cheaper option to use instead of Dolby. The film score from what is available is very good. LeVay's work perfectly suits the film and sets the mood, and has some upbeat synth moments for the car chase. I love the song Angel of the City that is played out in the first montage, and the rest of the album is pretty good. It's not Rocky IV levels of quality, but still a nice album. The mindset at the time was to sell an album based on the artists featured, and less so about the score. So it's hard to give LeVay's score a thorough review, but what's on offer is great music. But it's just unfortunate the rest of it has never seen the light of day. Hopefully in the future there's an expanded release by one of the many soundtrack labels. Ocean Software had managed to secure the license to Cobra and created a game based on the film for the Amstrad Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum. The player controls Cobra and must avoid various enemies throughout the game, including members of Night Slash's gang and people with bazookas. Cobra is initially unarmed and only has a headbutt as a defence. Weapons such as knives, pistols and laser sighted machine guns can be found inside hamburgers of all things, which are lying around each level. Shouldn't it be stale pizza? 
gameplay takes place across three levels, a city, a rural area, and finally you face off against Night Smasher in the factory. Critics at the time felt it was unoriginal and compared it to the game Green Beret, and others viewed it as a parody of the film. The Amstrad and C64 versions of the game didn't fare well with reviews, with Zap64 awarding the C64 game a measly 13%, saying it was unplayable, unoriginal, unprofessional, unimaginative and unacceptable licensing travesty and a Commodore user considered the game difficult and concluded that it was pretty boring overall. The ZX Spectrum version found the most praise, having been coded by the highly skilled Jonathan Smith, who didn't think much of the movie but wanted to make a Super Mario Bros. style game for the old micro home computer. He created a smooth scrolling game, which was tough to replicate on the old Spectrum, and despite being loosely based on the film, gamers loved it, and even returning to it now, it still plays very well. Your Sinclair wrote the game's designers haven't taken the film quite so seriously as it took itself. They considered it one of the best film-based games available, and wrote that it isn't very original, but it's furious fun. When you think of 80s action cinema, you think of Rambo, Robocop, Predator, Commando, The Terminator, or entertaining schlock like Death Wish 3. Cobra is up there with the big hitters, not down to say the quality of the movie, but what the film represents and how it looks and how it was sold to moviegoers at the time. Back in 1985, Stallone was on a high, Rocky IV was a huge success, he was in a new relationship with Bridget Nielsen, and his ego was in full swing. Now comes the opportunity to explore his previous ideas for Beverly Hills Cop, and repackage it into this Dirty Harry inspired action movie with Warner Brothers. The poster for Cobra is so simple and iconic. Just Stallone posing with an awesome gun, with shades on and dressed in black. He looks so fucking cool and a total badass. So it becomes pretty easy to sell this movie to action fans. But to me, Cobra as a kid and into my teens, it sort of passed me by. It was one of Stallone's features that didn't seem to be discussed or talked about. Later on, my friends would say to me it was an okay movie, nothing special, and so I didn't have this desperate urge to watch it. Of course, when it came to reviewing movies for YouTube, I had at that point seen Cobra, and despite my reservations about it, I actually quite enjoyed it on my first viewing. It of course had a number of issues, but overall it was a perfectly serviceable action movie. The common trivia with Cobra was how it was heavily cut down for theatres. So what you end up with is a movie that has been heavily streamlined in order to meet a runtime. What you get is a movie that does make sense, but ultimately it's very thin on the development of the characters and especially the villains. With the name Night Slasher, I instantly thought of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, a serial killer and sex offender whose crime spree took place in California between June of 1984 and August of 85. Ramirez also cultivated a strong interest in Satanism and the occult. I know Stallone often took inspiration from what was going on at the time when it came to writing his scripts, and I thought there might be some loose connection there, that he has been inspired by Richard and his crimes to develop the Night Slasher. But due to the flimsy writing for the villains, the potential for what could have been is never really explored or taken advantage of, which explains Brian Thompson's frustration. He in turn delivers a good performance, but he feels so generic and two-dimensional that he could have been a really great villain of 80s cinema, but ends up as another bland bad guy who happens to have a cool weapon. Stallone was at the top of his physique. He looks great in the part, but he spends most of his time putting on this gruff voice, sounding like he is stoned. Yeah. He doesn't have much of an expression throughout, but seems more concerned with how he looks, often wearing his shades indoors where it makes it difficult to even see, has a matchstick in his mouth throughout which may result in choking if accidentally swallowed, and a gun down his trousers pointing at his groin. He could mistakenly blow his nuts off. His character falls into the usual traits of a guy who doesn't care about himself, his apartment is a mess, he's eating mouldy pizza, you're seeing a character that isn't original. Again, a guy who takes on the bad side of the law and handles it all by himself, and goes above and beyond and gets in trouble. Stallone is taking an old formula and repackaging it, which happens all the time, but Cobra arrived in an already oversaturated market. Bridget Nielsen has never been known for being a great actor. She is cast because she has the looks and has the presence on camera thanks to being taller than most women on screen at the time. To my surprise, she does a pretty good job with the role. With Stallone essentially directing her, she's putting the effort in. She gets to show a range of emotions throughout and gives a believable performance when she's being attacked by the Night Slasher in the hospital. It's just unfortunate she's wearing a pretty bad wig. 
When it comes to the action, you often expect Stallone movies to really deliver in that department, especially after two Rambo movies, but Cobra falls a bit flat in that area. The opening sequence with Cobra taking out the guy in the supermarket gives you the impression that the film is going to kick ass. It's a strong opener to set the tone and show the audience who Cobra is. It's funny seeing all the product placement, the Pepsi signage is very much in your face, but it was a great sequence that is shot and edited well. So your hopes are high, but what follows is nothing really that amazing. The car chase is confusing and the geography is a mess. You have some cool little moments here and there, but it just didn't do anything different from what you've seen before. Cobra has this awesome machine gun that he uses in the third act, but ends up just shooting loads of guys on motorcycles. Once you see maybe three to four guys fall off their bike after being shot, it becomes boring pretty quickly, and it goes on and on. It's all very samey. Cobra gets into some punch-ups early on, with this fantastic neon lighting surrounding him, and it's a great moment. I just ended up wishing this happened more throughout, as he only gets into another one-on-one -on -one fight at the end, which again is short-lived. The stuff I've heard about the director George Cosmatos has always been on the negative side of things. Tombstone in particular, which he is credited for directing, the cast didn't get along with him, and the rumours floating around that Kurt Russell had taken on the duties as director. And in the case of Cobra, Stallone is very much in charge, and it's very visible there's a lot of Stallone style in this, with a heavy use of close-ups, and of course two montages which don't live up to the dizzying heights of Rocky IV, but Cobra has some good tunes for those montages to pay off. I think with a movie written by the lead, he is going to have a lot of control, and the director is only going to be used as an assistant. Despite Cobra making a lot of money worldwide at the time, and it was a big hit on home video, it's surprising to me it didn't have a follow-up. Cobra isn't really an original character, as pointed out earlier, but I could easily see Stallone return as him in a better story that gave him something more deep and involving, and with high stakes at play with the action being far more solid. For example, Andrew Davis, who directed Under Siege and The Fugitive, could have done something in the 90s to give the Cobra character a new lease of life. As it stands, Cobra is an average action film. That has some interesting visuals, it really captures that pop cultural mood of the 80s, does some great music, and it has some attitude to it that you can't help but enjoy. But the story sadly has been clearly sacrificed for business reasons, and Stallone is not fully focused on the production and as a creative. His personal life is very much his priority, totally in love with Bridget Nielsen, and enjoying the fact that he was at the time the biggest star in the world. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and click the bell to be notified of my latest retrospectives and reviews. Big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved and gain early access to my content and exclusive videos, then follow the link below.